the number one question I get is why in the world do you row a wood boat in rock gardens that can smash your boat with any mistake? They're like building a beautiful piece of furniture to kick down the stairs, and kicking it down the stairs is the point. That's why you build it. When you see a wooden boat in this setting, it will literally turn your head and turn the clock back 50 to 75 years. On this chilly October morning, Greg Hatton and Randy Dersham have returned to the Rogue River. They are setting off with their river buddies for a four-day trip. The thing that draws this group together is the passion for the river and river running. Some 20,000 people float this section of the Rogue each year, but these guys do it a little differently. This is Greg, and the beautiful wooden boat that he's rowing is a hand-built replica of a boat that ran the Rogue back in the 1930s. And this is Randy and his dog, Remy. He's in a boat so new that you can smell the final coat of varnish still drying. This is the first time this boat's been down the river. First day that it's been wet. You could say that their river running style is classic. And the river they've picked to run is not just any river. This is the wild and scenic Rogue River. It's a 34-mile stretch renowned for its raw beauty. In fact, it was one of the original eight rivers in America to be protected under the Wild and Scenic Act. For river runners, it's considered one of the classic rivers. It cuts a deep gorge through the mountains of Southern Oregon, and along the way offers dozens of rocky rapids to navigate. A challenge even for seasoned river runners like Greg and Randy. We built the boat to come down here, and to me, this is like the ultimate technical water to be running a wood boat through. Greg and Randy aren't the kind of guys to brag about their backgrounds, but they are both McKinsey River guides. They have run every major river in the Northwest and taken their wooden boats down the Grand Canyon several times. This trip is an annual tradition for them. They run the Rogue every October, but even with their experience, Taking wooden boats down the rocky road will test their skill. Within an hour of launching, they reach the first major obstacle, Rainy Falls. You can't run it. It's class five, six, and it would tear your boats up. They can't run their boats over Rainy Falls, but to the side of it is a rocky channel called the Fish Ladder. Okay, coming. Went Eddie out right through that drop. The fish ladder is the way to get wooden boats from one side down to the other side. We line the boat. Let her go, I got it. Watch the line. Come down this way. Oh, quick drop. It's the narrowest part of their trip, literally a stair step of rocks. So we wrangle our boats down, and there's some danger in that. You've really got to be coordinated and quick on your feet. Woo. But uh, that's the only way to get from the top down to the bottom and continue your river run. Not bad. Didn't look pretty, but... That lining of the boats around Rainy is, is kind of a, a rite of passage, if you will, for river runners. As you watch those little drift boats on the river, you can see there's so much more action, there's so much more activity, they're so much more responsive than just about any other type of craft. They'll give you a ride on the river unlike anything else that's out here. And you develop almost a relationship with a boat when it responds to your touch and it delivers you safely on the other side of a rapid because of the dynamics of the boat and the way it can move. That's pretty special. The first time I saw a wooden drift boat come around the corner on the McKenzie River, I fell in love. And then I started pursuing, how do I get one of those? And the conclusion was, you build one. 
and when you spend that much time laboring over every cut, every joint, every angle, caulking the seams, varnishing, sanding, you develop a pretty close relationship and an intimate knowledge of the boat that you're working on because you spend so much time paying attention to the little details. Although it's simple, there is this beauty in the simplicity. Just really nice, swooping, clean lines that relate to each other are what the drift boat's all about. When it's made out of wood, you get this special connection to nature, and you get the connection to the trees. I've run a lot of miles with Randy on the rivers, and uh, he's a good oarsman, he's a good boat builder. He knows the history. We're uh, kindred spirits in that way. He likes to run old school, and so do I, and so we're a pretty good pair. What do you smell, Randy? Find a bear. I love it when he brings the dog. It's nice to have a dog in camp because this time of year there's a lot of bears down here and they sound the alarm if there's a bear around and the bears are pretty leery when they know there's a dog around. That's a pretty good sized bear. Hey bear. You sleep better when you know there's a dog in camp with you. At camp, you can see another aspect of Greg's passion for river running's past. He calls his style canvas and wool. I kind of came up with the idea of, OK, if we're going to replicate the boats, let's replicate the camping. When you see a canvas tent set up in a place like this, it's just another one of those reminders of the history and the guys who came before us and the way they camped, the style they camped. It's nostalgic. Folks have been taking wooden drift boats down Oregon rivers for more than a century. On the Rogue, one of the earliest was the popular Western writer, Zane Gray. His novels first introduced the Rogue to a wide audience. His cabin still stands along the river's side. So it's kind of cool to see where he actually hung out and did his work. I could see how you could be very inspired in a place like this. As the team continues down the river, they pass pumpkins precariously perched on rocks. I think it started out as a guide tradition to put a few pumpkins out in the fall. This trip, we probably pulled about 40 pumpkins mm -hmm. off the water. <laughs> yep. Unusual. Yeah. This is unusually increasing amount of pumpkins. And 10 years ago when we were doing this, we didn't see very many. I mean, so you'd see a pumpkin here and a pumpkin there. And it was kind of cute, kind of clever, because they'd be in hard to reach places and make you think, how did that get there? And now there are so many people putting pumpkins in the river that it's, it's certainly is a mark of mankind onto the river. And pumpkins have become, uh, in my opinion, graffiti down here. I actually like the pumpkins. At camp, the mood is subdued. Tomorrow brings the two biggest hazards of the whole trip. The boaters bed down and hope to get some sleep. In the morning, Greg is quiet as he packs his boat. Ahead, the turbulent Mule Creek Canyon. Here, the river cuts through the solid basalt of the Cascade Mountains. Mule Creek Canyon, the water is rushing through there so quickly that you're literally improvising almost every move. You've got very little room to navigate. In most places, you're touching the wall of the canyon with the tips of your oars. It decides what it wants to do. It is literally sitting there percolating. Most folks do this in rubber rafts that can bounce off rocks. But wooden boats don't bounce, they break. Mule Creek Canyon releases the wooden drift boats. 
Randy's shiny new boat is now scratched and dinged. Luckily, it's not leaking. There's no time to relax. Around the bend is the most dangerous rapid of the entire trip. Blossom Bar is a notorious rapid on the Rogue that has a long history of wrecking trips. There are a couple of moves in Blossom that if you don't get right, you get into big trouble very quickly. At the scout point, when you're looking at the moves that you have to make, I mean, it, it's more than butterflies. It's, it, I, I wanted to puke. The very first move to pull left to right to avoid what we call picket fence. And if you miss that move, you're in big trouble. People have lost their river craft or lost their lives. And it just makes you appreciate the fact that you, you've got to get it right, because there are very real consequences if you don't. It's good when it goes right. It's good when it goes right. It goes bad real fast. <laughs> With Blossom behind them, the river and the boaters' moods relax. The current and the oars slow, as if neither wants to let go of the mountains just yet. There are no more rapids to run, and ahead of them, their cars are waiting to take them back to cities and day jobs and such, so they savor the slow final stretch. What a good day. It's a chance to fish, and perhaps more importantly, to appreciate this experience where river running's present and past overlap seamlessly, synchronized by the river's pull.